Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. So, oh, sorry, looks like we're live now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us live today. My name is Cheyenne, and I am a developer relations engineer here at the SWE Foundation. So as you guys know, we have the ongoing SWE Foundation X KuCoin Labs Summer Hackathon. And uh, one of the main reasons why we're here giving all these presentations, tutorials, whatever, is so that we can better help uh, provide more information, provide more knowledge for you guys to help you guys really solidify your core before really jumping into this hackathon if you haven't really delved into SWE before. So one of the biggest value props of SWE, of the SWE blockchain is that it is very different. It is very unique. There's a lot of stuff that sets it apart from other L1s. And in this presentation, Costas, co-founder and chief cryptography officer at Mistin Labs will be going through many of the details, many of the things that make SWE unique. So without further ado, Costas. Awesome, great to meet everyone again and happy to see some uh, familiar faces here attending. Uh, by the way, let me check very quickly how I can share my screen here. Uh -huh. So innovation. And voila, can you see, can you see my page? I hope, I hope you can. If you cannot, uh, Sayan, please uh, text me. So very, very quickly, um, I'm going to present something which is super useful for people to understand why SUE is uh, by far better in uh, many uh, like uh, avenues and how we uh, provide new cool features in the blockchain, the new modern blockchain world. And I would say that in practice, we paid a lot of attention since the very beginning of uh, like Mr. Labs contributing to SUI and afterwards helping, uh, getting some help from the community to provide all of these extra features that you are going to see today. Most of this work has been, um, by the way, from at least four different uh, avenues. One of them is we are the creators of the Move Language, SUI Move Language. Obviously, there are extensions after the original foundation that created the Move Language. The second one is the consensus and parallel execution, which means that we have faster and better algorithms to agree on what transactions will go to the next block and be visible to the community. The third one is around cryptography. Obviously, I'm a cryptographer, I mean, by profession, and I will explain a lot of details here. And the fourth one is tokenomics. At the end, I have some surprise. I will call them Easter eggs. There will be some cool labs that many, many of you can actually use them to even create a startup uh, using this technology. Um, so around the research and development, imagine that uh, especially the founding team of Mist Labs and before uh, we uh, actually uh, open source everything for SUI and all of this stuff, all of us used to work at Facebook and there we created the original move language and then we extended it. The most interesting stuff is many of the algorithms you will see today in this presentation and obviously some of you are familiar with have been awarded uh, some best paper awards in some particular cases. We found some attacks on systems that have been used in previous blockchains, including algorithmic attacks. So for example, I can tell you that uh, many of the people who contributed in SUI uh, were actually presenters on the most reputable crypto conferences in the last two years. And this is not like um, by luck. Uh, it's because there is some expertise here. There are some very, very knowledgeable people and uh, after Mist and Labs, the extension to the community actually brought so many new brains and new ideas to the system that I'm super happy that Mr. Labs, it's not the only contributor anymore. By, in, in practice, it's not even uh, like 50% of the contribution. Now it's on the community side. And because of this, now SUI has some features and many of the proposals are from the community, as I said, where it makes a big difference regarding the, the things that you can do in this blockchain, especially in the DeFi and the gaming sector. So as you can see, it's not only the, uh, the original uh, like contribution to SUI, is not only the SUI uh, repository itself, new cryptographic libraries have been uh, created, new um, achievements and uh, like APIs for the move language that is used in other blockchains as well have been uh, contributed by SUI developers. And many of these uh, like uh, standards that we use for cryptography, not only on blockchains, have been initiated by SUI developers. So the goals of SUI is not only to create like the Web3, the new language on Web3 that uh, can help us 
uh, all do whatever we can actually program in smart contracts. It's many different parts that will actually help on the UX as well. So from the throughput, you will see why SU is innovating on throughput and latency. These two are typically going together. So how many transactions per second you can achieve, but also how fast you can get finality in your transactions. And this, especially if you actually put them together and you have horizontal scalability, you can actually have a long, a bigger network with more validators, more full nodes, more archival nodes, and all of the uh, actors that are uh, participating in uh, a blockchain uh, transaction. And you will see that we can scale, SWE can scale actually almost horizontally. And then there is a lot of focus on the security based on expressivity. For example, you will see why movies uh, strictly typed. You cannot do mistakes uh, like in, uh, in other blockchains, especially EVM, where everything for compression reasons might be a number. And then you have to conceptually or understanding the contract, what it says to, to say, okay, oh, this number now represents an address. Oh, this number now represents a balance. And this number represents something else, uh, NFT ID. And uh, the other thing that was in the back of uh, our mind was cross-contract and bridge-friendly uh, design. And this has been maintained uh, even by uh, some uh, SIPs, like the equivalent of uh, BIPs on Bitcoin, uh, where people are trying to create bridges between SUI uh, and other blockchains like building liquidity in, into the network. But also it's interesting that we can also focus on cross-contract uh, bridging. So the one contract can actually talk to the assets of another contract. And then you will see all of the rich native APIs uh, and the modern tokenomics that SUI has. So all of these like 10 features here are going to be presented today in a high level format because there are individual presentations for each one of them. But now I will explain um, like the basic that someone has to have um, in the back of their mind to, to actually do uh, even a comparison on how SWE performs and compares against the, um, uh, all of the other blockchains. So the first one is SWE Move Language. I know that you have uh, been presented with uh, similar slides. I guess uh, Sayan also, uh, like the host of this meeting, has presented some uh, like amazing slides. Actually, I even used one of two of his, of his uh, slides in, in the deck. Uh, but it's a different move language since Facebook started because it's object-based. And you will see, right? I mean, the problem previously was asset management uh, in the sense that most of the blockchains were focusing on smart contracts. But then we said, okay, mm, do people, I mean, the end user, I'm not talking about the developer now, do they care about the smart contract uh, necessarily or about the ownership and the assets so they can see the things in their wallet? This is agnostic independently on what the wallet, sorry, what the smart contract is uh, having, uh, I'm like enlisting assets of some users so the users can enlist everything under one wallet without having any knowledge about which smart contract created it necessarily. And then there is also programming uh, uh, simplicity. Imagine if you are writing something in, uh, as I said before, everything compressed and because you, you cannot use a blockchain uh, that uh, is scalable, then you had to go with some limitations in the past. And now after solving part of the storage problem and the scalability and throughput and latency, now you can have more rich representations of your NFTs or all of your assets on chain. And this is what actually Move uh, offered here. And the other thing is safety. Safety is because Move itself, like the, the VM, uh, there is formal verification around it. Uh, you can also write your unit tests when you're writing a smart contract. And eventually, because it's strictly typed, as I explained before, and some other protections, there is no re-entrancy attacks, which is the most common attack happening uh, on Ethereum, like one contract uh, talking to another one, and probably there is no state update in between, and somehow you manage to drain an account. This is not possible in Sweden. Um, so uh, this is from Cyan, by the way. The most problems that we face today with other blockchains is typically the assets are in a in the hash map inside the smart contract. It's not under your account. So in order to enlist all of your assets, you have to go to each smart contract and actually try to find, to see actually which data structure is holding the assets and the mapping between the user, the owner and the asset, and then be able to understand all of the variables. And uh, if you can do this, then you can enlist all of your assets, right? I mean, this is very inconvenient and you have to do allow listing one by one, all of the smart contracts to understand what's happening. 
And the other one is obviously there might be contention, especially or congestion in general, if you're trying to access these hash maps, because imagine if you have a very popular block uh, smart contract, everyone is going to get the same something a row from this hash map, but you have to lock the full hash map. And then eventually there is uh, all of this uh, like pipe into one particular data structure, which means that we cannot parallelize stuff. And as you can see in many situations, because of storage issues or because of inefficiencies, you have to have a URL about the NFTs. But as you will realize, after we manage to have dynamic NFTs and put all of the content inside the blockchain, a new horizon is actually created. And you will see at the end of this presentation some cool applications that with URL of NFTs, this wouldn't work. However, if you put the data inside, then you can actually unlock so many features that you had in the Web2 world, but you don't typically have on the previous Web3 world. Uh, composability is pretty much one of the major issues. Right. How can I create, I don't know, a board ape NFT and then eventually can create an extension over the board ape NFT, which has internally a board ape NFT and somehow you link it to a particular, I don't know, hero in a game. And then you can use this NFT to actually um, have some extra uh, features in the game. For example, you can use it as a coupon. You can use it. Uh, you can even extend its features and all of this stuff. Composability is super important to be easy. And we see it firsthand by the big game studios that they're trying to build applications in SUI. And composability will eventually allow the combination of features from different game providers. And this will be huge, right? Imagine you're playing, I don't know, um, a game, uh, League of Legends and Dota, and then somehow you can combine the heroes and you can even have hybrids between them and you can even have accessories from one game to the other. This is a completely new world here. So the best things of Swim Move are, as I said before, ownership focused design. And this is happening because we're object centric. And then each object can even have child objects. So you can have like a list of objects that goes up to a root, which is like a real address. And then there is dynamic NFTs, composability, as I explained. There is also capabilities. So in some particular cases, you might say, hey, I, I have an example about this, by the way. And SUI also supports contract upgradeability if the developer of the smart contract wants to provide this. So I can see, I can foresee a few cases. This is a pattern, actually. For example, you might build a lottery application for which you don't even want the owner, the developer of the smart contract to be able to upgrade the contract, right? You don't want to have to be racked full and all of this stuff. However, there are other situations where you need upgradeability just because it's an NFT creator. The NFT creator wants to add new features and then you should allow upgradeability there. So all of this is supported by SUI today. So the problem with ownership, right? As I said before, most of the previous blockchains are focusing on the smart contract rather than the assets themselves. So the assets are living inside the smart contract structures. And this is, this is very common on all of the EVM uh, like uh, popular standards, including ERC20, ERC721, like the coin, uh, the coin RFC and the token RFCs and uh, the NFT RFCs. But however, you will see why SUI has everything under a particular address. Imagine a tree of address owning something and then these objects can even have children and so on. And they can even have dynamic NFTs like uh, an object having as a field another object which has as a field another object and you can create whatever you could do previously in Java, in C++, in all of the object-oriented languages. So how this is combined and how this is possible in, uh, in SUI is because everything is an object, right? If you have the smart contract being an object and all of the assets inside the smart contract being an object, it's not just a row in a hash map. And everything that you, even the, the, I mean, imagine in the real life, we're using nodes to transact and we have the balances in our bank. However, as you can see, you might have a $100 note in your pocket and another $100 note. How can you parallelize this, right? Oh, you have two notes now. You can give one note here yeah, on, on one customer and another note to the other customer on parallel. You don't have to wait between them. If you had the balance as it was happening in uh, like account-based system, then you have to wait, right? Because let's assume that you have $200 in your balance. When you pay the 100 and another 100, because you don't know if there will be an overflow, you have to order them and say, oh, you are first. And then after your transaction, one, another 100 is remaining. And now I'm able to provide 
the execution of the second transaction. It cannot happen in parallel. And SUI, apart from this, is also introducing the owned assert objects. This is very important because, as I said before, the notes, the dollar notes, as I, as I explained, can be owned objects. They are owned by the, the user themselves. But something sometimes where it requires some um, protection against race conditions. For example, imagine a DeFi where everyone is going into the DeFi and they are trying to get um, like the same resources. Then you have to have total ordering. Then you need consensus. So you can have parallelization, total parallelization on owned objects. If I have an NFT and I sell it, I can in parallel sell another NFT. And I can in parallel actually receive NFTs. And I can also receive uh, other funds, right? I don't need to wait for ordering because I don't care if I sell these two NFTs in parallel. But if we're all trying to get a, like a DeFi opportunity just because there is uh, some arbitrage opportunity, for example, there has to be ordering. However, another pop, another important um, benefit of SWE is parallelization can even happen on shared objects because in theory, if you are touching different DEXs, you don't require necessarily to order these transactions for the two different DEXs. Uh, this is something that uh, like the SWE team is working on to have parallelization even on the consensus level. And it is possible because a shared object is the congestion point now, but two different uh, shared objects do not have anything to, to do between themselves. And that's why you will hear, this is the first motto of the day, SUI is not account-based. SUI is not UTXO-based. SUI is a hybrid between them. In practice, we have an account, but this account is actually owning objects. Imagine the UTXO model on, on Bitcoin, but it's not like you spend it and then you lose it. It's versioned objects. So you can mutate them. If I have a $100 note and I give you $50, I can mutate my previous one to now have $50 remaining. And a new one was created to go to the, to the customer, to the, pay, to the person that I paid. So there is all of this, uh, like whenever you, com you compare all of the blockchains, you know that SUI now is a hybrid between the two models. So assets and ownership, uh, this is very easy now because nothing is just a number, as we said. We have literally object types. If you are uh, like a first uh, uh, bachelor, a uh, first uh, like year bachelor student, you will realize that one of the first examples is, oh, we have a tiger and we have a cat and we have a dog and we have all of this stuff. You can have all of this in three. So you can say exactly what you're expecting in a function and what the output will be. And it's an object, right? So you know exactly if the object is linked to the module itself. Even if they have the same name, you know from the module name that it's a different type, of course. And it's, it's very interesting, like um, you can even have like a card title in the second example here. Show me your title uh, and pay a fee and I will give you back a card registration. And all of these are user-defined types and all of this stuff. The, the second motto of the day is uh, all of the objects and all of the, all of the uh, like or transactions, all of this can flow across trusts trust boundaries without losing integrity. You can even have a situation where someone gets a card title and puts it inside another object, a wrapped card title. And this card title can even be uh, uh, combined with, I don't know, different uh, features. For example, you can even have um, the, the car wheels or car, car accessories and all of this stuff. And you have a full car. And the full car is a combination of a card title, many other things. So imagine composition here, which is super important. Uh, the other important stuff is the dynamic NFTs, right? So in theory, most of the image NFTs that you were familiar in the past typically include a URL somewhere and probably some uh, metadata NFT that can be updated as a whole. But in practice, if you store it outside, sometimes it's a bit more difficult to, to actually update them online, like inside the transaction, but also other smart contracts to have access to your uh, particular fields. But on the other, like uh, as an extension of it, to be able to even update them on chain, as if you have like a house and this house is changing owner and this house is changing age and, and this house is changing a rate for more cuts and all of this stuff, you can now have uh, fields that are mutable, completely mutable. And obviously this unlocks a new world of possibilities. And because as I said before, these fields do not necessarily require to be the standard types. Uh, a particular NFT can have as a type another uh, object type, right? And then eventually you have full structure of whatever you can imagine. And this is the concept of dynamic NFTs. 
Uh, this is what uh, like uh, Mister Labs also did with Sui Friends. You have the NFT, which is a copy. Imagine the uh, 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 like an NFT that is created using some randomness and AI, like cross mixing, cross breeding uh, copies between them. But then apart from the NFT, you can have another object, which is accessories over copies. And then eventually you can send them as fields, or dynamic fields over your copy bar of over this NFT. And then eventually you have the full uh, thing, as you can see here, which is a combination of accessories plus another NFT. And now you can imagine how someone can create games very easily with Sui just by combining assets between themselves. As I said, even between different vendors. Um, this is a slide actually I personally like a lot when I'm comparing Ethereum with Sui. It's, it's very simple. On Ethereum, you have the address and account of a user that has a balance and has a nonce. And also you have the contracts where typically the contracts have also address. They define some functions on how you, uh, um, the API of the contract. And also typically there is an ownership map there. You will see a hash map, a table, some data structure inside the Ethereum contract. And there is where you can find, oh, I own something in this contract. Sui is different. In Sui, we have accounts, and the account is just an address. There is no nonce. And typically, the nonce is used on Ethereum to protect against double spending, right? But do we care about the account now? No, because what do you care about double spending? You don't care about double spending the account. You care about double spending the assets of the account. So what uh, Sui did actually moved the nonce we call, uh, Sui is calling it version, right? Move the nonce into the assets now because the asset is an object. As I said, everything is an object. Now you version the objects and there you bump the version whenever you are spending it or you are mutating it. So in practice, you don't need to affect your address. You can use the, you can sign multiple messages on parallel because the only thing that is bumped is something on your assets that you're uh, transferring, not your account. Your account is immutable in practice. And then you have all of the fields. And as I said before, each object can have uh, like children objects and all of this stuff. And the contract, you see, there is no ownership map anymore. The contract, you can have an ownership map if you want, right? Everything can be completely in par with Ethereum. But if you are smart and you want to save in cost and you want parallelization, in practice, the contract is nothing more than ID and functions. And whatever the output of the smart contract is, it's becoming an asset. It doesn't live under the memory of the SWIG contract anymore. And now you can use the asset on parallel. So this is the main difference between Ethereum and the SUA account. And as you can see on Ethereum, we have two congestion points. If I try to change my balance, or if someone is sending me some balance, they lock my account. If you can compare this to uh, relational databases, in practice, any access to my account is blocking my account. I cannot parallelize, paral uh, I cannot parallelize transactions in and out from my, uh, my address. And the same is happening at the contract layer. If someone is touching this ownership map, everything has to be locked because uh, there is an update in the full table. And imagine this is a DB table in practice, so we have to, to um, uh, order everything. In practice, Ethereum is ordering everything even between the Ethereum contracts. Um, so another thing that actually made the big difference was the Kiosk framework. So it's a different NFT standard uh, compared to uh, what you were familiar with on the Ethereum world, on the EVM world, or even other uh, like Solana and others. Uh, because in practice, there is a standard now that is offering pretty much like new features. Like, of course, you can list an item on a marketplace and continue using it. You create even a safe for your collectibles. You can even uh, build a system with custom logic for your safe. You can guarantee royalties if you want, right? It's not now the royalties are guaranteed by the framework itself, right? Even if there are mistakes, obviously the, the framework is helping you to not make any mistakes. And you can avoid centralization, even um, uh, like uh, you have an, an option, even the user, I have a slide, I believe, yes. Even a user itself can actually have a single owner and creating a kiosk. They can even create their own marketplaces. There is a big difference between your own marketplace now and the previous uh, marketplace we had, I don't know, even with uh, the traditional OpenSea and so on, you have to enlist something under a particular um, uh, uh, marketplace, but now you can even create your uh, marketplaces by yourself. So you have full control of your kiosk. Kiosk is the real world, right? Kiosk is, you have a kiosk of your NFTs. And then eventually, if you control all of this stuff, we can even have marketplaces that they showcase all of the kiosks out there and so on. So you have a completely different experience on how 
you're uh, creating and selling NFTs. You don't have necessarily dependencies to some particular um, big marketplace, but you can also enlist your kiosk in a big marketplace, which is uh, like for discovery, super useful, especially with all of the events that are emitted and so on. Um, so the user actions there, very quickly, I think there was another presentation from Damir here, is you can place items there, you can take items from your kiosk, you can borrow items both mutably and immutably, which means that uh, you can read information without changing uh, the, um, uh, anything on the, on the NFT, so you can use it even for transactions that you just need someone else's uh, like NFT to read it. And uh, you, can, you can delist an item, of course, and all of this stuff, like all of the active listing required uh, for your kiosk. So API and SDK, this is super important. Some people don't know about this stuff. So there is sponsored transactions on SWE. Imagine if you're familiar with the account abstraction on EVM, that they're, uh, like even Visa did some work, uh, Visa the company did some work around account abstraction and pay masters you can have someone else paying for your transaction. And this is super useful. For example, there is a company, Sinami, that is, uh, can, can even help you to do sponsored transactions uh, if you have some deal with them and all of these uh, like, uh, uh, opportunities, even if you don't own any SUI, if you somehow find the sponsor for your transactions, you can transact on chain, which is extremely useful, especially for the gaming and I would say even uh, like users that are not DGENs, because they can come to SUI, they don't necessarily require to own SUI. They might receive some NFTs, but if they want to do some transactions with their NFTs, they can ask from someone else to pay for their transactions. And imagine what can happen off-chain. You can find another uh, way of paying, like a regular payment trail on the web too. You are actually buying uh, something off-chain, some capabilities of, hey, I can use you as a sponsor from now on. You don't necessarily buy SWE. So even uh, like big institutions can actually have, trans have transactions on SWE without ever owning any SWE, right? And because they're using sponsors for this. And there is the two applications of programmable transactions. The programmable transaction, you can imagine it as a batch. And another benefit of this uh, batching is the output of the previous transaction can be used as an input to the next transaction and so on. You're putting all of these transactions into one block. And why this is useful? First, you are reducing the gas. So it's a gas compression mechanism because in practice you can, you can combine multiple transactions into one in a batch format. And there is a benefit here, right? You are signing the full batch only once. So SUI validators have to do only one verification like of, the, of your signature, which means that for all of the transactions, you will pay less. Uh, just because you saved a few things uh, by loading all of these things on, on memory, uh, much faster than if it was individual transactions. And you can also verify a lot less signatures than one by one, all of the transactions by themselves. And the second super useful feature on programmable transactions, you can build flash bots. Because of the atomicity, you can even create a cross DEX um, application, offline application, where you will create programmable transactions that you are buying from one uh, DEX and you are selling to the other DEX. And then in the same transaction, you're buying something from another DEX and you go back again, right? And because of this atomicity, you own all of these assets that you are using in these transactions. It's single owner uh, programmable transactions. You can have all of the uh, like cool features of a flash bot. And today, by the way, we're open sourcing a copy bot. We call it copy bot which will help uh, all of the developers to build DeFi agents with the most popular SUI DEXs, like Turbos, Setos, uh, uh, SUI Swap, and others. Um, so what about Move API and examples around Move? Um, just a clarification that everyone can hear me. Is it okay? Yes, I hope it's okay. Cool. So we have... Every user has access to a clock. You can use real timestamp, not only the block uh, height on SWE. And some applications are very uh, like uh, uh, careful on how, how they take like the state of the timestamp. And in SWE, you have it. Even in single owner transactions where there is no consensus, you can also access the last epoch timestamp. Now you have one day timestamp references, but at least you can do a lot of interesting stuff even with them, especially, I don't know, with some bonds that expire in a particular date and all of these things that uh, like timestamp at individual, like per second is not 
uh, like super important. However, per day, it's super uh, useful. The other thing is there is a rich mathematics and DeFi API in SWE. People can actually have all of this uh, like functionality, uh, square roots and all of the things that you require. And you can build your own decks very easily. And because we also have, uh, SWE has many cryptography examples, you can find, if you go to the SWE repository, the last folder in the GitHub, you will see cryptography examples with how to conduct a lottery using the DRAND um, uh, committee. How can I do a coin flip? How can I verify an Ethereum signature? Literally an Ethereum signature. And this would be super useful for, um, for bridges, right? You can even get the transaction from Ethereum. And because SWE supports all of the cryptographic primitives that Ethereum supports, in theory, you can actually build uh, light clients of Ethereum and many other things that it was a bit more complex with other blockchains if they didn't have support for all of the existing blockchains. And there, there is even uh, like examples on how you can do ZKP, zero knowledge proofs in SWE. And the other thing is you will also find many, example, many examples of how you can create your first game with dynamic NFTs on SWE. And here is um, like a very interesting um, hint that you can get. In SWE, if you are smart, and you can actually try to change the logic that you are thinking when you're con constructing a, a new smart contract. If you can take advantage of uh, parallel execution, especially with single owner objects, you can create a total new experience with sub-second finality that is not like feasible in any other blockchain. For example, I can give you uh, like a very simple game. Imagine you're playing a chess game and there are two users, of course, white and black, and these users do not necessarily require to play chess a set object. Why? An interesting trick is we design the NFT of the game as a single owner asset. I own it because I'm the white player and then I'm sending it to the black pawn player and the black pawn player now makes their move. They send it back to me and I do the same when I finish with my move and so on. If you can combine this even with multi-seek, like we have a referee, you can have a fully secure game with blazing fast latency. And this is super useful. Imagine this can be used even in uh, other games like poker. Everything that is a turn-based game can use this pattern. What I did here, right? I created a new way of playing games without requiring a certain object, even if the game is competitive. It's between two players. Um, so three consensus. This is super interesting, right? I explained before that apart from move, there are so many ingredients in SWE that make it fast and parallel. And this is happening because there is a situation, as I explained now with the game of chess, where you can avoid full consensus whenever it's possible. And if there is no consensus, as you can imagine, you can have a blazing fast uh, finality. So how is this possible? This is possible uh, organically in the framework. So we have a transaction. The transaction is sending or like the, the user is sending the transaction to all of the validators. And I will explain why here there is some similarities with what Spotify actually did uh, when they created the streaming service there. So you are sending everything to the validators and you are receiving back the signature from the validators. Now, you know exactly if a transaction, the framework knows and actually the wallet will know if the signature is requiring, if, sorry, if the transaction is requiring full consensus or not. If it requires full consensus, you get the up, uh, the upper uh, like path. You go through execution and then eventually you have a checkpoint and all of this stuff. But if you don't, you execute the transaction very quickly by getting only signatures from the validator. And then you have finality. This will go to a block, but you don't even care. You have a receipt that finality will happen 100%. And why this is useful here and what is the similarity with Spotify? Right. Spotify eventually, especially for those who even watch the movie and all of this stuff. So you have your servers, you're serving from your servers the music and all of this stuff. However, you can even have, any, you can even have P2P transfers uh, between the users, especially if there is locality and all of this stuff. We use the user themselves to get the signatures from the validators to do the aggregation of the signature and return it back. This is useful because previously in all of the other blockchains, you send the transactions to the validators. You don't participate anymore, but the validators have to engage into a more complex uh, protocol, order transactions, and so on. Why we don't order transactions? There is a small hint here. 
because part of the work is happening from the user. So the user is receiving the signatures, the user is doing the aggregation and returns it back. And this feature, the fact that you didn't, you didn't, uh, uh, you didn't go to the validators and say to them, hey, you do all of the work, I will help you. This gives the lower latency that we're expecting here. Um, and yeah, this is an example of the versioned objects that, we, that SUI has. Imagine you have an object with an identity X and it is on version 25. Then this object, when you send a transaction, the only thing that is happening is uh, some mutation there and it gets a new version. And, but you have another object now, you're sending it to a transaction Y with a different version than it's, uh, when it's spent or mutated, it's getting a new version and so on. So you're using all of the cores of the CPU to parallelize all of the transactions that are happening because all of them are different objects and they don't touch each other. And this is super useful for all of the single writer examples. And here is a thing I will, I have a, a link with uh, like all of the applications you can use. I guess you can see the new web page that I opened. What can you do? What can someone do with single owner applications if they don't want to go through consensus? Obviously, all of the peer-to-peer -peer transactions like the network of Visa and MasterCard can be single owner. You don't necessarily need consensus here. Why? Because if I'm paying someone, like I'm going to uh, get some gas from the gas station and someone else is buying something from Amazon, we don't need to order these transactions between ourselves. Right? So in, in any case, peer-to-peer -peer transactions of anything, coins, NFTs, and all of this stuff can be uh, single owner transactions. The, the blockchain can also be used as a public bulletin board, right? Everyone can go and store publicly accessible uh, data, files, links, and metadata on parallel. Why, if I'm creating a Wikipedia on chain, I should wait for someone who is creating their website on chain, right? They're completely dependent transactions. Even by myself, I have 20, 20 websites and you will see there is a place where I have internally, right? You can have your personal GitHub, Overleaf editor, Wish, shopping list, everything. You can create new applications. You can literally create a web page in Sweet today, right? You can do it. That's an NFT and in the NFT because it's mutable, mute, sorry, it's mutable NFT. You can even have dynamic NFTs there. You can use the blockchain now to host your web pages. And if you combine it with a domain name service, eventually you will have a real web page run on, uh, on the blockchain itself. But apart from this, you can even create your own web, your, your own blog, your own rating platform. You can create a trip advisor. You can create a Yelp. You can create whatever you want. The same thing goes for private messaging. I have a, a specific application at the end of this presentation, how you can create a Twitter or a WhatsApp or a Signal on Sui very easily. And as you can see, there are situations where someone will say, mm, can, I, can I create something that typically requires consensus, like a lottery? Yes, you can do it, right? There is a situation, let me find the lottery example. It's an optimistic decentralized lottery. So this one, can allow you to create a lottery by issuing tickets. You're buying a lottery ticket in a single owner format, right? You're just getting your ticket from an engine, but then only the declaration of the winner is actually requiring the set object. 99.99% of the transactions is buying tickets and only at the very end, you only need the set transaction. And the set object transaction is only run by the winner. And the way it works, imagine, as I said before, SUI is compatible with zero knowledge proofs and fraud proofs because we have this functionality of the cryptography primitives that are required to do it, which means that what you can do is you can have a fraud proof system here to run a lottery. The winner of the lottery goes there with their ticket and say, I won. And if nobody challenges me in one day, I am literally the winner. And everyone, any observer can go and post a better winning ticket and challenge the, the one who said, okay, you're claiming the, the win. So we can build very easily roll-ups, L2s, even lotteries on SUI just because of the primitives that are supported. Um, you can do many things. I suggest that you go, if you write on Google, single writer apps and SUI, you will see this webpage. You will find so many interesting examples. I think there are at least 20, 23, 24 here. You can build almost anything 
uh, unless it requires uh, full protection against race conditions. So I'm going back to the to the crypto API, right? So cryptography now is one of the major advantages of SWE. We have many APIs there. You can use them to actually build cool products. There is a originally there was a blog uh, post from from Mr. Labs. Now everything because the community now is. Uh, as I said before, providing more interesting content now. You can even find things in SWE. And then the R&D that is happening here is there is a dedicated library. It's called Fast Crypto. It has some of the most efficient implementations in Rust of all of the primitives that are used in SWE. And I can tell you for sure that many other companies, including Fang companies, are using the Fast Crypto library. And this is the backing engine of SWE. Um, so SWE, apart from this, also the developers of SWE also improved the security of some signature algorithms. For this, for this particular case, EDDSA, there were some issues even with popular wallets, including hardware wallets, and uh, we managed to find like better libraries and how you can protect against uh, like some unbelievable attacks that were impossible. To, we thought it was impossible to happen, but they were possible to happen, and we fixed it. And the SUI team, actually, the Mistin Labs uh, at the very beginning, and now the SUI uh, developer team has actually fixed this for everyone, not only SUI. And you will see zero knowledge proofs, the two uh, speed up in uh, some common use cases. So it's very fast, very fire in SUI. Uh, there is some work even on solvency proofs. We don't want the same thing with FTX or uh, uh, Mount Gox uh, that happened uh, in the past. So all of this happened through the R&D development team of SWE. Uh, what SWE has now? SWE has native authentication agility, which means that someone can use more than one algorithms. So on Ethereum, if you go, it's the second row. You can use ECDSA K1. Right? This is the algorithm that you can use, and these are the MetaMask wallet uh, uh, types uh, that are supported for EVM chains. But SWE supports all of them. So you can have EDDSA, you can have ECDSA, the Bitcoin and the Ethereum elliptic curve. You can even have ECDSA R1, why this is important. And it's rare to see uh, like blockchain to support it, but in practice, this is important because you can even have walletless users on SUI, just because your iPhone, or if you have a, uh, like a modern uh, Android device, they do have enclaves, like secure chips inside their, uh, the mobile device where you can support signatures. And these signatures are not compatible with the Ethereum or the Bitcoin algorithm. It's not even compatible with the Solana algorithm, all of the rest of the algorithms. It's a particular ECDSA curve and SWE supports it. So this means that in practice, you have many, many applications that do not necessarily require a wallet. And you will pretty much see if you're, if you're planning to build a startup that in practice, Many of these uh, like uh, wallet experience that we have today in the future might switch into something that you just use your iPhone itself without a wallet to sign transactions. And another benefit is the native multi-sig. The native multi-sig is super important because we realized that many users, especially after uh, the launch of Mainnet, were not ready to go to threshold signatures. The multi-sig is very simple cryptography. You don't necessarily need the cryptographer in your team. You can have a K out of N um, uh, account, which means that, I don't know, three out of five, seven out of 10 need to sign a transaction. And it's very simple to just concatenate the signatures, no expensive mathematics, no trusted ceremonies. It's super easy to have um, a multi-user account. And I can tell you for sure that many of the, I don't know, market makers or uh, liquidity providers and all of this, they find it easier than going to threshold signatures just because they lack experience or they don't, they don't have like, they don't want a dependency to a third party company that they provide threshold signatures for them. I'm not saying as a cryptographer, you should always use this. If you have threshold signatures, you can also do it. But SUI, what it did is doesn't penalize users that are using multi-sig. They pay pretty much the same cost as a single signature user. And that's why we also limit N to be less than 10. So it's secure against denial of service attacks and all of these things. But this is super useful. And I can explain why um, uh, native multi-sig can offer the like solution for most applications and most developers. And what's happening now is you will see new authentication with zero knowledge proofs. 
You will see new authentication that people don't even know what your authentication mechanism is. This is again using zero knowledge and you will also see sent to objects. So people can actually have smart contract wallets. And this is very close to the account abstraction model that you see on Ethereum. So about uh, the multi-sig, imagine what's happening if you have a K out of N, right? You can support N out of N, K out of N, A or B, A or B or C, A and B. And because we support, SUI supports weights, which means that one of the keys might have uh, more power than the other keys. In practice, you can do A and B or C, which means that the administrator and one of the two, uh, like, uh, I don't know, head employees in the company. And you can do all of the things that you see here. This is super useful because you can even have A or K out of N, like either the CEO of the company or three out of five best employees in the company like the highest ranking employees. So all of these are possible with the algorithm that is supported natively in SUI today. And th there is another important stuff here, important thing, is you can even have different algorithms for the K out of N. There, there has been situations where some people are obsessed with security and or they want to use their iPhone as a 2FA and they say, I want two out of three. So because I keep my mnemonic in a secure place, the two out of three is my iPhone and another mnemonic. If I lose my iPhone, I can go back and retrieve the other mnemonic that I have in the box, in the safe. And again, it's a two out of three. So now you can have two-factor authentication just because we support all of these different algorithms. And the two-factor authentication can be with different algorithms, different weights, different structures, as you can see here. So zero knowledge proofs. This is also super important because with zero knowledge proofs, you can have both privacy and compression. The first thing is like the technical part. This is the algorithm that SWE is supporting with a very fast verifier. There is the, the only limitation here is, in, and this is only for um, uh, ensuring that you don't overpay gas cost, is there are up to eight public inputs, but there is a trick, it's a useful trick. You can use a hash and convert the public inputs into witnesses, and then eventually you only have one public input. Many developers that I've seen, because people are using zero knowledge proofs today in SWE, they just go with this trick to have like the fastest possible verification because this actually implies that you pay as less as possible on the gas cost. And the other important stuff is you can build in CERCOM. CERCOM is uh, like a framework, a language where you can write your uh, circuit, your zero knowledge proof logic, and then you can verify it in SWE. So people are using it for privacy, for a login, for KYC, for private transactions, even for AI training. So if you have zero knowledge proof, you can do a lot of things that typically are impossible without this privacy. Or for compression, like games, a roll-up can be created, and bridges, of course, because you can have a zero knowledge proof of another blockchain that is verified inside SWE. Um, the other important stuff, especially for the gaming sector, is randomness. In SWE, you can have two-player Satoshi dice, Coin flip, in practice, you can have multiplayer Satoshi lotteries. These two are not requiring any external source of randomness, but it is possible with SUI, and we're open sourcing this, I think, on Monday, um, that uh, people can even use as an example to build any Satoshi lottery that they, they like. Um, uh, there are some uh, partners already that they're working on it, and they're very, very close to, uh, to launching. There is also support, native support, of ECVRF and BLS, so verifiable, um, uh, native verifiable function, uh, randomness functions. And there is also Oracle support. There is support for Supra Oracles, for Switchboard, Chainlink, DRAND. Everyone who is producing random beacons can verify them in SWE. So people who want to use the existing technology that they have, or if they want to use like a committee-based randomness, they can do today in SWE. And in the recent uh, like days, we already have an example of a native VRF where the validators of SWE will be the, the committee. And this is going to be used for particular applications. So the crypto API, I explained most of them in uh, like in previous sections. As many hash functions as you require to be able to have bridges. Signature verification, not only on the native level, but also in the smart contract level. So you can build custom logic that you verify your own signatures and you have ECDSA, EDDSA, BLS, and so on. 
There is a full elliptic curve API. It's also supporting the Ristretto, it's not curve, the Ristretto group. And coming soon, you will see eight word mnemonics instead of 12 word mnemonics. We managed to do this. Yes, it's possible. Uh, you will also see pre approvals. Sometimes when you're playing a game like, I don't know, eight, uh, the, the chess game or a backgammon game or any, any game for which you need to press a click every single time you're making an action, because, we're, because SUI is object based, you can actually define in your wallet some rules and you can say, hey, if you see that I'm playing this particular chess game, do not request my signature every single time. You can do in the background signing and you can do up to $2 because I'm telling you, you can only use this particular coin to sign transaction. The worst that can happen is the DAP is malicious and I'm losing $2. So this one will be super useful for UX. Finally, we have tokenomics and the tokenomics are staking. SWE has a very interesting um, uh, way of, of doing staking and liquid staking is... Uh, is, is coming and eventually what's happening is the SUI holders delegate their voting power into some um, uh, like validators and these validators if they meet the threshold, the limit, then they can literally be in the next epoch a validator and in return this validator returns some of the profit back to the delegators. So there is all of this uh, interesting stuff, there is a small commission that is held by the validators and the rest is returning back to the users. And you can do it in SUI from day one. So most of the wallets do support it and most of the custody providers are also supporting it. Um, the other important stuff is the storage fund. Many of you might not know, but some of you are already familiar. If you see a, on SUI Explorer or SUI Scan a transaction in SUI, you will figure out that when you're paying for a transaction, you pay for storage, but some of this storage is going to be returned back to you when you burn the object. So you will even see transactions that are actually with negative gas. So you're earning money just because you pay for both execution and storage, but part of the storage uh, can be rebated back to the user. And this is super important because now in theory, someone can even uh, like store bigger objects, but they know if, they, if it's temporary, uh, like solution, when they delete it because they don't need it anymore, they will get some or most of the part of the money they paid for storage back. And this is important because you're also incentivizing. There is a uh, uh, like uh, a particular uh, bank where the, 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 the validators are actually storing all of the storage uh, uh, like fees, where it helps new validators when they come back to earn some money from this instead of just downloading the full state of the past and earn nothing until they uh, verify some transactions. Imagine that it's super important for validators to be incentivized to, to, to join a network, to also earn something because they're storing the previous state, right? Before they even start signing transactions. And because there will be uh, like this particular uh, like stake rewards uh, like uh, the, the bank uh, of uh, like all of the fees that people are paying already, then from this one, they're going to receive some money just because they're maintaining the state. And the most important stuff here is the second bullet point, the gas price survey. So the validators are voting uh, if they want to change how much does it cost per operation in SWE. And this is like the reference gas price. And all of the rest are like uh, things that are very useful and like Sue is doing the, the norm here, the, the best thing that uh, like is possible at least today, plus all of these good features to maintain the value of predictable gas pricing in the future, especially compared to dollar, compared to the cost of the validators and so on. Even if the price fluctuates a lot uh, in dollars, it might be by far better to use Sui compared to other blockchains. And the five cool applications, uh, that's like the, the final slides. You can build a Twitter in SWE. And as you can see, it's nothing more than an NFT, right? What is a tweet? It's an NFT instead of an image. It's a text NFT. And uh, you can even have like mint, burn. You can have like is a repost. You can just have a boolean here. And if it's a repost, in practice, it's a retweet, right? And you have a post ID. You can have a reference from one NFT to the other NFT. And in practice, all of this, uh, like Twitter experience, can be encoded into SWE today. And some of them, actually, all of this can, can be single writer, single owner applications, which means no consensus. 
it doesn't necessarily re uh, mean require ordering between my tweet and someone else's tweet, right? We're uh, just tweeting under our account and the ordering is irrelevant. Obviously, it will be in a blog. We will have some timestamp pretty much. But at the time of submission, you don't need to wait for finality. And you can marry them. You can, you can attach into them encryption public keys that you can even com convert this into a WhatsApp and signal. What is a public key again? It's an NFT under your account. So if you want an encryption public key under your account, you just publish a public, NFT, public key NFT, and then people can see it and they know where to encrypt your messages for. And this is better than WhatsApp, for example, because it offers the transparency features automatically, right? When you send something, an encrypted message to someone, you have their, uh, their public key. And because you have their public key, uh, in practice, what's happening here is nobody can change your public key. It's under your account. They need your, your private key to update it. In the case of WhatsApp, for example, as you know, many of us used to work for Facebook and, and WhatsApp. This was actually my last days at Facebook. Um, obviously, you need the transparency there so you know that the company is not switching the public keys of the users. Here, it's easier because it's a public bulletin board. Everyone can see whatever is happening. The nice thing with that is even if you have a Twitter here, what you can do is you can have a public ledger of all of the tweets, but then on the right side, you might have different UXs with different filters, right? So someone can build, can use the same mechanism to create applications like Kids Twitter. I'm filtering everything that is not uh, like uh, uh, liable for uh, a kid's audience. You can have the Twitter itself. You can even have a Sui Reddit and you can even have like different types of uh, applications that read from the same database, but they do their own filtering. And the other thing, as I said before, it's already happening on Sui. You can have coin flips very, very easily. Um, it's a lot, just using hash functions internally with commit, reveal, and uh, challenge because you also need um, uh, you need this uh, option. Wait uh, for a couple of days until you see all of the design out there, and there will be at least one company was launching with CoinFlip in Sri. The other one is this was used for a governmental actually um, uh, um, application. Uh, it's um, you can even have KYC using zero knowledge proofs in Sri. So in this particular example, someone uh, created an application where they prove that they are over 21 years old and they're creating some token on chain with privacy about your real age but you are proving that you are at least 21 only to the, to the person that is interested, not to the whole world. But because there is a commit scheme into the blockchain and then a zero knowledge proof over your KYC credentials, you can have this in SWE today. This, these are real transactions happening in SWE, by the way. This is testnet, but uh, it's, um, it's, it's going to happen on, uh, on, the main, uh, on the main channel very soon. And what's happening is we're expecting for ZK Login. ZK Login is a system that you can use Web2 authentication and you don't need mnemonics anymore. Um, there will be a few announcements from Ademigi in the next few weeks. Uh, but the whole idea is login with Facebook, Google, or whatever you, you want, and automatically you get an account on Sri. You don't need mnemonics. And another interesting application, this is the last slide, is you can even have encrypted NFTs or private NFTs in history. Um, this is also something that uh, is using zero knowledge proofs in the back end, or if you can even use fraud proofs. But you will see many applications will change the way they're thinking about NFTs. And that's why I'm fighting even by myself on Twitter that sometimes dynamic NFTs and the fields of NFTs should be on chain because they allow all of these things happening. And because it requires composition and zero knowledge proofs, it will be possible in the future to near future to have games or you can have NFTs from creators where only the real owner, the actual winner of the auction or someone who wins something in a game can see the full contents, but all of the rest can only see some of the contents, parts of the content and not all of it. However, you have a 100% guarantee that when I reveal my real NFT, I couldn't have changed the, uh, the, uh, the content itself. And you're also getting guarantees that if someone sells you something that doesn't commit, sorry, doesn't reveal the commitment of the seller, you're going to have a rebate. You're going to get your money back. So all of this, you will see pretty much marketplaces with obfuscated NFTs and people will, will buy them, but only the real owner will see the full content. 
So yeah, that's all from my side. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Costas. I feel like every time you speak, I learn like so many new things. I think I know I'm personally going to rewatch this video, like probably at least like five times. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Thanks um, so much. Yeah. yeah. We are right at time. It is nine o'clock. So I think if there are any questions like following this, I think the best place to reach you or us is like the, of course, like the semi-official Suinami Writers Telegram channel. That's pretty much been our go-to. We also have Discord. And yeah, don't forget, the hackathon is inching closer and closer every day. So feel free to use this information. Uh, feel free to use all this information you learn in your new hackathon. Costas went over like dozens and dozens of interesting applications, some that are being built already, some that are not being built but have the potential to do so. So I would more than recommend you all use that in your yeah, just use that for consideration when building your projects. So thank you so much again for your time, Costas. And I'm sure we'll talk soon. And thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This video is already on YouTube, I believe. So feel free to watch it whenever you want. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Happy to help on everything if you have more questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye.